I'm Andre Perry, and by way of introduction, I'm actually going to start my PowerPoint because it's the way I introduce myself, believe it or not. I mean, a lot of people will go, that's pretty boring. You're, you're using a PowerPoint to introduce yourself, but it really, um, I incorporate my, my life story into my work. I think we all do in so many different ways, but it really is reflected um, in my work. Now, a lot of this you can get in my book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in American Black Cities, available wherever fine books are sold. At the Brookings Institution, I study black majority cities and neighborhoods, um, places where the share of the black population is 50% or higher. There are obviously too many bl uh, black neighborhoods to put on a map, but here are the uh, black majority cities throughout the United States. Again, places where the black population is 50% or higher, and this is done in 2018. And you can see there are a lot of them. Um, there are more than 1,200 black majority cities throughout the country. Most are concentrated in the South. If you know uh, anything about demographics, you know that there's never been a time in American history where the majority of black Americans did not live in the South. Um, but um, it, but you certainly see the cities going up the eastern seaboard, some in the Midwest, a few on the West Coast. There were actually more of those um, 20 years ago or so, but they're starting um, to drop off um, across the country. And that was taken in 2018, so I'm not exactly sure if those dots are there anymore. But I study the assets in all of those dots, the assets meaning the businesses, the, the homes, the infrastructure, all of those things that if you invest in, theoretically, you'll increase economic and social mobility, providing the basic services and, and goods to, to sustain life. Now, I tend to focus a lot of my work on housing, housing being probably the one of the most important assets in your life. Obviously, it provides shelter. Um, it provides, it's a, a mechanism for wealth building in the country. This is uh, where I grew up. This is 1320 Hill Avenue, Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, Wilkinsburg is a small black majority neighborhood or municipality surrounded by Pittsburgh on three sides. So when, I, when people ask where I'm from, I do say Pittsburgh most time, but I'm from Wilkinsburg. Um, but as you can see, the house is pretty run down. It's been abandoned for 20 years. Um, at the time this picture was taken, in 2018, it was valued about $13,000. Um, you could essentially uh, uh, take it off the hands of the county or the city by agreeing to pay a certain amount of taxes on it and getting it up to code. Um, but the house is worth so much more, much more to me. You see that woman in the upper right-hand cor corner? Her name is Elsie Boyd. I call her mom. As the story was told to me before I was born, mom made a deal with my maternal grandmother that she would take me into 1320 Hill Avenue. At the time, um, my mother was poor. Um, she already had a child of 15, had me when she was 17. She was probably abused. So mom did what a lot of black matriarchs did back in the day. She took in kids when someone needed support or help. And as you can see, she took in a lot of kids, black kids, white kids, um, mixed race uh, uh, children. Um, by the, when I was born, by the time I gradu graduated from high school, she probably reared about 12 to 15 kids of varying durations. Some would stay a few months, some would stay a few years. I would stay from birth, essentially, to graduation from high school. One of the reasons why she had to do that my father here, he was a heroin addict. He was in and out of prison. Eventually, he was murdered inside of Jackson State Penitentiary, which is located um, right outside of Detroit. And throughout my life, I heard um, conversations about he made poor decisions in life. So I wanted to study the, um, the assets, the, the built environment that surrounded his choices in researching my book, Know Your Price. So I started looking at the overarching context in which he lived. And I'm gonna save the boring stuff, um, uh, history stuff, but I just wanna 
uh, mention a few things that you may be familiar with in your classes. So they both lived in areas that were redlined, where the federally backed homeowners loan corporation drew red lines around neighborhoods, deeming them unworthy of investment. Um, they also lived in areas where highway construction barreled through neighborhoods. So um, they built the civic arena and um, they said, uh, and, and uh, 365, where in the Hill District, where mom lived, it m moved her to Wilkinsburg, where I eventually was raised. Same with my father. He lived in a part of Detroit where the newly developed highway that was um, eventually built to take people to the suburbs of, of Detroit was built, displaced them. They were subjected to the unfulfilled promises of urban renewal. So they lived in areas that were bulldozed and nothing ever replaced it. Um, surrounded, they were in areas where there was predatory lending. Contract leasing was a big part. All these contracts that um, people thought they owned their homes and they really didn't. If they missed a payment, it, um, they never got, um, they, they, they were kicked out of the home. And then they could not leave. So, because there were uh, racial restrictive housing covenants, whites only areas, uh, thank you very much, um, whites only areas surrounding them. So they couldn't necessarily leave. So they were in the places in which they lived. So I wanted to do a study. I wanted to look at the impact, in general, the impact of those things on home values in those neighborhoods. On this chart, as you can see on that x-axis, on that horizontal plane, that's the share of the black population by zip code. And on the y-axis, as indicated by the price on top of the bars, that's the average list price, and we looked at both Zillow and census data, of those homes in those neighborhoods. And so, as you can see, it's a pretty linear phenomenon. Homes, and um, as the share of the black population goes up, the home values go down. Now, homes in, in areas where the share of the black population is less than a percent, on average, this is 2018 numbers. We ran those, these numbers um, uh, two months ago, and I'll, I'll maybe share a little bit about that. Um, but homes in areas where the share of black population is less than a percent, on average, about $340,000. In areas where the share of the black population is 50% or higher, those play, uh, those, uh, on average, homes are about half as much, about $184,000. Now, a lot of people will say that's because of education, that's because of crime. But those are things you can control for in a study, and that's what we essentially did. We took that absolute list price, um, but then we controlled for all the structural characteristics, size of home, number of rooms, all the physical manifestations of the home. And then we controlled for neighborhood amenities, education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics, because we wanted to get an apples to apples comparison between homes in black neighborhoods and homes in white neighborhoods, essentially. And what we found pretty much astounds that homes on average in black neighborhoods are underpriced by about 23%, about 48,000 per home, Cumulatively, it's about 156 billion in lost equity, 156 billion. And this is happening all over the country. Um, we, uh, this number is about 233 billion now um, after the, the, the housing boom um, during the pandemic. But this is happening all over the country. Wherever you see a magenta circle, that's where home values are, um, are less, significantly less, Wherever you see a green circle, that's where home values in black neighborhoods are, on average, priced higher than their white counterparts. Just to give you a sense, in 2018, it's about 17% difference, about 70,000 per home in the Los Angeles metro area, I should say, metro area. Just to give people a, a little sense of what's going on, in Lynchburg, Virginia, if you helicoptered a home in a black neighborhood, and placed it in a similarly situated neighborhood that only difference is it's mostly or very little black people in it, it would increase in value by 81%. 81%. 
Rochester, New York, 65% difference. Jacksonville, Florida, 47%. Um, I'm going to San Fran um, this evening, actually. 27% difference. Um, again, there are places where homes in black, uh, na neighborhoods are priced higher on average. Nashville, plus 10%. Wichita Falls, plus 16 Boston, Boston, um, plus 23%. And I always say Boston is no less racist than Lynchburg, um, but the home prices are higher. Now, and I always, what's uh, it's sad is, you know, well, this is not funny. The name Lynchburg just says, I'm always like, wow. <laughs> like, we need to move on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'm going to put this into context. $156 billion. What does that mean? Because this is a number, right? What does that mean? It w $156 billion would have financed or um, uh, started more than 4 million black-owned businesses based upon the average amount black people use to start their firms. It would have paid for more than 8 million four-year degrees based upon the average amount of a four-year public education. It would have replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan 3,000 times over, covered nearly all of Hurricane Katrina damage, and it's doubled the annual economic burden of the opioid crisis. It's a big number. Now, I put that last bullet there to, you know, to bring it back home to, to speak. If my father lived in a neighborhood where home values were higher, he would have had better research schools, because schools, guess how we pay for our, our schools partially in, the, in this country. He would have greater opportunity to start a business, greater opportunity to um, go to college, greater opportunity to get a home, greater opportunity to move to a better neighborhood. This is why I always say that there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. When things go wrong in, in, in black neighborhoods, what do we do? We blame black people for the problem. We try to correct people and not the policies that extract wealth and opportunity without anybody carrying a tiki torch or wearing a hood. These are the policies that peop, everyday people support. Everyday people support. Now, um, one of the th ways I approach this work is I, I, I borrow from Tik Tek Nan, a Vietnamese philosopher, who, and it's one of my favorite uh, sayings in the, in the whole wide world, he said, if you're growing a head of lettuce and the lettuce is not growing, you don't blame the lettuce. You look to see if the soil's enriched. You look to see if it's getting rainwater. You look to see if it's getting sunlight. You never blame the lettuce. But when it comes to black communities, what do we do? We blame the lettuce all day long. What my research tries to do is really say, okay, what's, you know, what's the, what are the structures that are keeping communities from growing? Because nothing grows without investment. I don't care if you're talking about education. I don't care if you're talking about communities. I don't, if you're talking about people. Nothing grows without investment. So what I try to do is calculate the penalty for living in black neighborhoods so we can restore that, that lost value that's been extracted by racism. That's the foundation of my work. And I'm going to, I want to get into a discussion, so I'm going to just briefly move into some other areas that's related to housing. But first, oh, I got to show you this. So in 2018, and, and some, I don't know if you pay attention to it, but some of you may, there's been a lot of discussion about appraisals, home appraisals. Um, in this country. Appra appraisals, if you don't know, is essentially is trying to home appraisals where you try to establish a value of the home and they use this price comparison co uh, technique where you compare, um, you, you, you look at another home in a neighborhood in terms of its value to, and, and other uh, homes in the neighborhood to try to establish value of a, of a home. But before all this talk about people whitewashing their homes, taking down all the black art, the black, taking away the black books, the hair products, and then replacing them with white ones, and then getting an, an appraisal, and it comes in much higher. Before all that happened, in 2018, we testified on Capitol Hill with the, I testified with the appraisal industry on this very issue. The report came out, and, and, it's, and it really took off. 
people are like, hold up, what's going on here? Is this true? They called us in um, to testify on these issues. Now, this is Representative Al Green of Texas. He's um, a member of the Financial Services Committee. Um, and he got into a big back and forth questioning with us. Now, he asked us a very basic question. Do we believe that there's discrimination in, in housing and uh, in, uh, home appraisals? Now, I want you to take a listen to this exchange. If you think black people are being discriminated when their property is being appraised, would you kindly raise your hand? One person on the panel. If you think that, for fear that I'm not communicating well, if you think that black people are not being discriminated against when their property is being appraised, if you think they're not being discriminated against, kindly raise your hand. Okay, hands now, we're getting some consternation, I see. Now, I show that clip not to shame people. I mean, maybe just a little, um, just a little. Because that clip did not age well. The people, all those front, Folks who led all, all the members of the appraisal industry, they, I mean, they're the presidents, presidents of the Appraisal Institute, Appraisal Foundation, um, another major appraisal group. They're no longer there. There's been several lawsuits, high profile cases. Um, and I, and I show, share that with students and others who constantly question the data on this stuff. Since then, Freddie and Fannie have done their own studies. They found the same thing. Uh, you know, some of your major universities, they found the same thing. Um, but there is such a resistance to really understand or uh, uh, accepting the facts around these issues. If, remember that chart I showed you that home values decrease um, when the, the black population in, in, uh, increases, the reverse is true too. A few white people move in a neighborhood, all of a sudden, the home values go up, right? What, my, what this research tells you is not about the value of the home, it's about what? The value of people. Who we deem valuable determines the value of the home. And it's and it's in our policy, embedded in our policies. Again, I try not to attack people. I, I really don't attack people in these conversations around race. You'll never hear me blame a single person, even appraisers, right? I attack policy. Policy has done more damage than any one person could ever do. Red Line set a template for the way we think, even researchers think in this way, right? So this is just my, this is the Perry bias. This is when I was a, a professor at, at the University of New Orleans, I always, every, every once in a while I say, okay, this is my Perry bias, this is me talking. It is, and this is my Perry bias. I do believe in not blaming people. Even in these harsh, like when you're getting in debates, in the class or in the dorm or wherever, I tend not to blame people. I think it, it gets in the way of understanding structural racism. Now, you can disagree with me on that. Um, there's certainly some bad people in the world. Bad policy is worse, in my opinion. Now, um, I'll get off my high horse now. Um, but I want to talk about business. We did another study around business, and, I'm, and I swear this is going to be brief because we'll get into a conversation. Um, business evaluation, we re released another report the following year, in 20, uh, two years later, 2020. Um, the re reason why this is important, most people start their businesses using what? The equity in their home. So if you have less equity, you have less business, right? So black people represent about 14% of the population, only 2% of employer firms, meaning firms with more than one employee. Um, only 1% of black business owners were able to obtain a loan their founding year compared to 7% of white owners. Both are relatively low because most people start their businesses using their personal wealth, largely drawn from um, their, their uh, residential property equity. 
Black entrepreneurs are, are denied bank loans more than twice as often than their white peers. And when we do get loans, we pay higher interest rates. Um, a lot of business closed during the Great Recession. Uh, a lot of businesses closed during the pandemic. Only one of the bright spots is you saw actually a, a, an increase in um, black business ownership during the pandemic. Um, actually, of, of, the, of the different racial gender groups, black women started more businesses proportionally than any other group. People used their um, relief funds to start businesses. It was a, a pretty fascinating thing. But I want to just get into a, a study that we did around business uh, development or, or, or businesses, because I would go to, when I present data on community development, I hear all the time, well, we would have more businesses if, if they were of quality, um, if, we, if they provide better, better services. So I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to, to, to see if that holds up empirically. So we got business revenue from Dun & Bradstreet, um, proprietary data, you gotta pay for it. So most things that we do, we use public uh, uh, databases. So this one, we had to pay for the data. So um, could I, we, in most of, the, of our studies, we give the code, we give the data, so you can run these numbers yourself. That's what we try to encourage teaching at the, um, at the Brookings Institution. But then we scraped all the Yelp data from businesses all across the country to get a sense of quality, right? And then, um, again, we controlled for neighborhood conditions, wealth, spending power, education, all those things. Again, getting um, a, a apples to apples comparison. Okay, now this is, um, uh, it might surprise some, it doesn't surprise, uh, it didn't surprise me. Black, brown, and Asian firms actually score higher on, on Yelp than their white counterparts but they all get less revenue as they're situated in black neighborhoods. Let me explain. See that magenta line? That's black, brown, and Asian firms. The gray line is white firms. Um, in every kind of neighborhood, um, those uh, um, businesses, and both individually and um, as individual racial groups and collectively, we just showed the collective one here, um, score higher on Yelp. But as the share of the black population goes up, the scores go down. That is not good for business. Your perception of the neighborhood shouldn't affect the perception of the business. Quality business should be a quality business, period. Um, this is costing Businesses upwards, quality businesses, businesses four stars or higher, upwards of $4 billion. $4 billion a lost in, 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 um, because of that. Now, there's a saying in the black community I used to hear all the time. Our ice is just as cold. Our ice is just as cold. That wisdom is backed up empirically. That black businesses, brown businesses, Asian-owned firms, they're just as good, if not better. The, the, they were better, but it wasn't significant, but they were better. Um, and so there's relatively no difference between the firm. It's the perception of the community that's impacting the perception of the firm. And I can't say it enough how bad that is for business. If, in black neighborhoods, what's happening is highly rated businesses are then forced to compete with lowly rated businesses. You know, better the business, you don't, you compete with better businesses. But if they're being reduced, they're then competing with inferior businesses. You get less revenue in the, in the neighborhoods, you get less economic and, develop, uh, and community development. You get what you get. You, get, you, mean, you increase your chances for crime, you increase your chances for people not owning things. It's a, it's a vicious spiral. So if you have housing devaluation, you got business devaluation, you have less opportunity. Now I'm gonna just really close out. How do you get out of this? You got to invest in people. I'll just jump real quick to that second column. If you invest in place, which a lot of our policies do, opportunity zones, things like that. If you invest in place, you'll raise property values 
And if people can't keep pace, guess what? They get pushed out. So you got to figure out ways to invest directly in people. Um, create new homeowners. Create new um, uh, uh, business owners, entrepreneurs. And you got to cut the check. The one thing I, I love about the business data is that when, when you go through these entrepreneurship programs to get a grant, they make them jump through all kind of financial literacy courses and accounting courses and things like that. What the data show is, is that black, brown, and Asian-owned firms, they don't need that any more than anybody else. That, that they know how to run businesses. They're just not getting the revenue. They're just not they're being devalued. That's the issue. So cut the check, get the investment. We also need, um, and that's why I said remove the unnecessary bureaucratic barriers. Don't make people run through these stupid hoops um, to prove quality. It's a ruse. Um, you do have to invest in place, because if you don't have revenue in place because of devaluation, you're going to, you're, you know, infrastructure is going to crumble. It's not going to be, uh, the beauty of it is not going to be there. You're just not going to have that revenue to, to fix up a place. So you do need to invest in infrastructure and um, the neighborhood. When we wrote the, the business paper, I was so worried about releasing it because it did show that your businesses are going, may suffer in a black neighborhood. Right? So I, you know, I did not want to release that. But I feared more about not showing that businesses in the hood are just as good. I didn't mean to rhyme that, but that, that was a bar. Well, it was a bad bar, but. Um, and we need to remove policies um, that extract wealth. I'll just bring up the appraisal issue for me. And again, I don't like blaming appraisers. I like blaming policy. The price comparison model is fraught, largely because if you compare one um, home to another in a neighborhood that's been discriminated against, to establish value, you're just going to recycle discrimination over and over again. You never get out of it. And that's what's generally happen, happening. Yes, there, there are cases of individual bias of appraisers. No question. But even if you diversified all your appraisers, made them all black and brown, if they still use the same tools to, to evaluate property, they're going to come up with the sim same results. So for me, it's like we need new models, just like we use data um, captured over an entire metro. That's how Freddie and Fannie's going to do it moving forward. I mean, they are. They're going to use automated valuation models. And we, we set it at desktop, got all this data to come up with home values. That's going to be the standard. I, there's not going to be, they're always going to have human appraisers to a certain extent. But it's going to move, move much more towards automated valuation models. No question. This, they're already moving in that direction. And then, and we need to install anti-racist policies. Um, it's not enough to take down a racist monument. You've got to replace it with something else. You know, you know and, I'm, and I mean that literally and figuratively in these debates about removing things, understand that you, we still need to, ways to value property. That's not going to go away. So you need to replace it with, like, the old with something new. And, I mean, even on campus, you can remove a statue. you got to replace it. <laughs> you know, we're not going to be in a place with no statues, <laughs> you know, like no m m memories and things like that. So what do you do? And that's where you got you to gotta put your best thinking on. Are, are you going to replicate some of the social ills of your time? Or are you going to move towards something progressive? And you can get more information from my book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this. My, my, my favorite plays in the whole wide world is this play called Two Trains Running. And it, um, in the play, there's a main character, Memphis. Memphis is about to have his property seized through eminent domain by the city of Pittsburgh, um, who's building the Civic Arena. That, that actually happened. Um, they offer Memphis uh, $15,000 for his property. 
He says, no, I'm not selling my property for $15,000. I know my price. I got my price. It's a, it's, but it's a refrain throughout the uh, play. Um, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says this over and over again. I got my price. I know my price. There's another character, Hambone. He paints a fence, what he thinks to get for, and it, he made a deal to paint a fence in exchange for a ham. He paints a fence. He never gets his ham. Throughout the place, says, give me my ham, give me my ham, give me my ham. And we don't know if he had, if he had mental illness before um, he painted a fence, but eventually he goes mad and dies demanding his ham. Now, and people are like, damn, that's pretty sad. Isn't it? But actually, there's a happy ending. Memphis, the main character, gets $35,000 for um, his property. And the moral of the story is, to, you got to know your, that you have worth. You gotta, and what I try to do is give people the price to stand on. Now, what I also try to do is give people the price to stand on without them going crazy and dying. Right? Th this is hard work. If you are in public policy, know that these solutions require group thinking, <clears throat> not in a negative way, but they need multiple people working on these projects. Because if you go in this alone, you will go crazy and die. I mean, you're going to die one day, but uh, earlier than expected. I mean, you, it is hard work. So thank you very much. I look for, that's when you're supposed to clap <laughs> and, and show me some love. Or... Or throw tomatoes, either or. I mean, I'll take either or. Um, but I think actually we'll have a, a small discussion. Yeah, so I, I want to I start by <coughs> oh. your, your comment about um, bad policy uh, and the consequences of bad policy. And I know that right now you're working with the, um, with the Biden administration. And so kind of what are some of the things that you're doing to make sure that, again, you're getting close to those kind of better policy outcomes? Yeah, you know, and working with an administration is, is interesting. Now, I've worked in different policy arenas in my life. I, I started off in immigration, immigrant educational rights. I, actually, I mean, I was one of the researchers on the, that worked on the DREAM Act. This is a long time ago where, you know, we're working with Senator Orrin Hatch. I, I don't know if you know, a Republican. And, you know, he actually sponsored the DREAM Act. You know, like it was amazing. So I worked in that uh, area, worked in education policy. And now I'm working in housing and other things. And when you work with an administration, you know, you, you quickly realize that they often use research at, on the campaign trail. And in this case, all the local groups and as well as myself, um, Biden started when he was um, not even the Democratic nominee. He picked up this research on home values, and he started running with it, you know, and it became a thing. Um, he gets the nomination on the campaign trail. Homes in black neighborhoods underpriced by uh, 48000 for homes. Sometime he, he, most time he fumble on the number. He would say but, <laughs> different numbers every time, right? But he would get it. Um, um, even as um, three weeks ago, he cited me in a study. Eventually, when he got in, in um, he cited me in a, um, a forum. Um, when he gets, becomes president, he says that he's going to form a first of its kind interagency task force. It's called the Property Appraisal Valuation Equity Task Force, interagency task force that brings in Freddie, Fannie, HUD. Um, um, OCC, all these different org, um, um, uh, agencies involved in housing, and they release a report. And it was largely b built around my research. And all my life, you're, you know, public policy researchers, we're dying for this opportunity. <laughs> like, all our life. And I get it. You know, and, but when you're inside of it, you realize how you can become a bullet point, a talking point. And even on this issue, I said, look, you don't blame people. You blame policy. 
Don't escape. While I certainly think appraisers are not the, the best people in the world. 95% are white, 75% are male. Because value is mostly socially constructed, there's going to be bias in that. Significant bias. With that said, I don't believe in blaming people. Like, I believe in looking at the policies that they implement. Because, like I said, you could diversify the field. If they use the same tools, they come with the same result. To me, good policy, good policy never blames people. It does not scapegoat. And I get, and you get into it with administrators because guess what they're going to do come um, a few, in a few weeks? They're already saying, look what I did for the black community. We created PAVE. We're changing this and that. Not necessarily. You found one little person, group, subgroup to blame. What about the lenders? What about the real estate agents? We can go on. What about the labor market? All of these things impact value. So for me, it's like, you know, don't get seduced into, as a future policy, research policy, you know, getting your day in the sun and then, you know, riding on that. You know, it's also just about making sure that you address, in this case, the range of factors that impact value. It's not just appraisers. So that's where, I mean, but, but let's be clear, bad, pol bad and good policy um, lasts. So redlining, look at redlining. Well, look what it has done. You know, certainly you have slavery, Jim Crow race, racism. You know, coming in a close third, redlining. You're talking about systematically keeping black people um, keeping wealth from black people. I mean, that the, the, the racial wealth gap now is about eight to one. I mean, that was a specific anti-black policy. It was, the lines went around black neighborhoods regardless of the quality of the housing stock. It was just red lines around black neighborhoods. It kept wealth from going from one generation to the next. That was targeted and it lasted it really to you can make an argument it's still a holdover from the past so um, that's why my goal is to get good policy um, because if you can get good policy not scapegoating policy it will last for a long period of time there are places that have developed and have not displaced you know, a, a positive, I mean, this is what the power of universities can do. They can be a blessing and a curse, as you probably know. Particularly in small town, I wouldn't categorize U, um, USC in this um, way, but if you are Grambling State University in northern Louisiana, you are the anchor for a black majority town. If you develop broadband access for the university, you develop broadband access for the entire community. There are places that have used their anchor institutions to improve and develop the entire community, and they're still overwhelmingly majority black, and still the residents are there, but their quality of life is higher. So what we, what we are trying to do now, I'm actually, there's a chapter in my book, Know Your Price, um, called Buy Back the Block. So one of the things that I'm doing around, the, we're do, starting in three cities, we're actually trying to work with a, um, a, um, a, a group of developers to buy back blocks in a way that doesn't displace residents. Now, every, and in every community, there's, there's folks buying back the block. I mean, Nipsey Hussle became, I mean, is noted for that in this area. But we haven't figured out the right mix of things. Because it's typically a rich person comes in and buys up all the property and develops that. That's not necessarily going, uh, is what we want. You know, we gotta figure out ways to have more inclusive growth. Because in, by the, 
I mean, this ownership thing is a problem. We don't have the black developers, the fund managers, the banks, the homeowner. Like, we got to improve all those different things. And so I'm always trying to figure out what's the right mix of people we need to buy back the block in a way that doesn't harm communities. But I don't think that there's any one solution or place, but I do know there are places we, we, we have developed and it hasn't displaced people. I've been asked to conceptualize a research park in Atlanta for HBCUs. HBCUs are mostly in opportunity zones. I've not been gun ho on opportunity zones for the reasons I stated. If you're investing in brick and mortar and not people, um, it's, not, it's, it's not conducive for growth. However, man, if you can figure out ways to improve human capital and develop places, you know, I think you could do it. So I'm actually going to work with a few um, um, opportunity fund, um, opportunity zone fund folks to come up with a strategy to potentially create a research park in Atlanta for H that are built around HBU HBCUs. That would um, hopefully increase the amount of research coming out of those institutions because they're mostly undergraduate institutions. You don't have research faculty, so we want to develop research faculty. We want to um, commercialize um, patents and um, and, and, and increase entrepreneurship in that in a re, in an academic sense. Um, we want a research park to to uh, help the local community. I mean, that's that is supply chain heaven down there. You're talking about Coca Cola, UPS, um, uh, Delta. You know all these different things that a research park could actually help. You know so. Man, when I, I think of, I do think that there are ways to utilize opportunity zones, but the, as it is currently constructed, it's, it's, it hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't. And it hasn't been the big boom that everybody thought it was gonna be anyway. You know, it just, it, it just hasn't, I mean, it hasn't been bad, it hasn't been good, it's been really non-effectual for the most part. And so, um, but I, I want to try to use the power for good. We'll see. I work at a think tank. The, the difference is when I was a more of a pure academic, I didn't necessarily care about communication as much. Now I'm constantly thinking about how to communicate these issues because I have to persuade policymakers. I have to per persuade students. I, you know, before, I could care less if I entertained you. I, I, when I was a professor, I would go up there, da, 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 do it, learn it. Now I gotta persuade, <laughs> like in ways I never did, thought before. I mean, and when you're in that pos position, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta use the right words, like, you'll never hear me say agglomeration or, like these, these words that academics make up. And I'm not, I'm not disparaging the folks in the audience. I'm not disparaging you, but I, cause I was one of them. But I have got to figure out, but even cause this is where I'm, I kinda, I didn't even like using the word devaluation. But it was, it was general enough for me to use. But then, and this is the, the book, while I love writing the book, and it's been great for me, it was a tool to communicate ideas in a plain way. The way I told my story, I never, I, I didn't even, I never really researched my father until writing this book. I never shared anything about my father. But for people to get this idea that we are changing people's lives with bad policy. I need to, so when most times when people see me, and you would hear this, I would hear this from, you know, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth, blah, 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 blah. 
Nah, actually, this is where I'm from. Then it becomes a whole different story. And I actually, am, I actually think that's bad intellectually. I don't want to be a representative in that way. But it's a great communicating tool. People pay attention, like especially if I go to communities. They'll say, when, cause I, when I go to Detroit, where my, where my father was really from and where he died, when I go to Detroit, people believe in me. That shouldn't be the case. Like you should look at me and my ideas for, for the value that they add. However, you know, I'll take it because I do believe in representing truth. And there are truth, true people living in black communities that are diminished every day. Where I'm from, if, I t if, if you were from where, if I said I was from Wilkinsburg, they would look at me like, huh? That you can't be. Because we're not supposed to do anything. And, what, but this is sad. And I'm, again, I love working for the Brookings Institution. I love doing what I do. But if you look at the educational and family trajectories of the folks that are working at, at Brookings Institution, not folks like me, right? So I have to change that. I have to change that. I'm a researcher. I believe in empirical evidence. To, but I also believe in mobilizing and organizing people. This work is to organize and mobilize people. Because peop, these systems won't change themselves you will change systems that for good or for bad. I just wrote a piece on this. I keep saying, like, I literally write all every day of my life. One of the blessings of not having uh, teach students, I get to write all the time. You know, I was joking. I like students, too. But um, I wrote this piece about um, community activism and how it is really the way systems change for good or for bad. Redlining was a local policy, a local idea that was codified and resourced by the federal government eventually. It worked its way to Washington. And good ideas won't come from Washington. Good ideas won't come from the president of, the, of, of USC. They will go to it and come back. I, I just really do believe, it was me working, like all these things I do, guess where I socialize them? At the grassroots. I get, I, in, in housing work, I got housing advocates, I got reporters, I got all these people to s socialize it, and then 2020 happened, and it just took off. It took off. You know, but I work at the Brookings Institution, so we, we work with heads of state. We work with CEOs. And you can, I mean, I get in, my colleagues and I argue about this all the time. I don't care about the muckety mucks of the world. I just don't. I do what I have to do because, you know, I am, but I really am passionate about working with young people. If there's not a young person on my panel, a young person, like, you know, I'm like, well, I won't do it. I just won't. Because I really believe in systems change. And that is about mobilizing and organizing, not just about having the data. So with that said, I'd like to close out. Round of appreciation. <laughs>